Hi everyone, it's John, here to answer your most burning questions about science and our videos in general. This episode will be focusing on all the things that made you curious when watching videos from our Thermodynamics Advent Calendar in December. Lesson number one. When someone tries to sell you a perpetual motion machine, there's always a hidden power source. Tom Scott and I made a video about debunking perpetual motion myths. The thing that many of you questioned was whether the water was really the hidden power source behind the Dippy Bird. There were lots of comments about the power source being the heat of the room rather than the water. It's technically true that the heat and the relative humidity of the room drives the evaporation of water from the head, but that kind of misses the point. The driver of the motion is a temperature differential between the head and the base, and, that's, and the water is the thing that allows that differential to continue. So while the water isn't the source of energy per se, I think of the water as the fuel. In the same way that you say petrol or gas is the fuel for a car, rather than saying that technically the power source for an internal combustion engine is the chemical potential energy locked into bonds of long hydrocarbons. So I admit that there's room for a bit of technical pedantry, but I stand by my characterization of the water, rather than the heat of the room, as the fuel. The water is what drives this process by evaporating. You could do it without water by heating the bottom, but in this setup, we use the water as the fuel. The zeroth law of thermodynamics is actually an observation and states that if two thermodynamic systems are in thermal equilibrium with a third system, they are also in thermal equilibrium with each other. Mr. Peanut asked, is the zeroth law basically just a restatement of the law of congruence from geometry? Yes, in a way, it's called the transitive property. But not all systems are transitive, so the zeroth law is a really important thing to state. Emmett followed it up with, is there anything at all known that doesn't follow the if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals B rule? Actually, yes, there's many systems that aren't transitive. Rock, paper, scissors, for example. Uh, in a transitive system, rock beats scissors and scissors beat paper, then rock would also beat paper, but the opposite's actually true. You can find examples of intransitivity all around you. Food chains aren't transitive, sets aren't transitive, economics, psychology, the list goes on. James Anderson asked, uh, great video, but in my opinion, the best way to explain this subject is in terms of molecular vibration and the Kelvin scale. To me, it makes it easy to visualize. Shake slow, cold, shake fast, hot. That's not a question, Lena. But I think we can all agree that the best way of explaining this is through song. So let's think about the energy of gases in a tin. The particles are moving fast and bouncing within. The faster that they move, the harder that they are. And the measure of their average speed is temperature. Swamp Thing 401 asked that if the first law is immutable, then how did the NASA EM drive pass peer review? To give a bit of background here, the EM drive is a system that can supposedly generate thrust without actually needing any propellant. It's a little bit crazy. So while it doesn't violate the first law of thermodynamics, as it does have an initial input of energy, it does have serious problems with Newton's third law of motion. NASA's paper passing peer review is an important step towards an EM drive, but it isn't proof that it works, or even that we understand the mechanisms behind it. The reviewers don't even consider the results valid as of yet, and they haven't been replicated or independently verified. They were simply considered interesting enough to be published and shared with the wider community. The forces suggested in these models were so small that many physicists believe they're experimental errors. After watching Susie Sheehy talk about thermodynamics and particle accelerators, Bradford Townsend asked us, why are we not talking about conservation of mass and energy? Is mass not just a different kind of energy? It sort of is conservation of mass and energy. Mass and energy are famously linked by Einstein's E equals mc squared equation, which says that they're essentially equivalent. That means you can think of one as a different form of the other, if you want. Particle physics experiments like the Large Hadron Collider work by smashing particles of known mass together at known energies, and discovering how that mass and energy get rearranged. I think we don't say conservation of mass and energy because one, the law of conservation of energy was formalized before we realized that they were equivalent, and two, it's kind of a mouthful. Back to perpetual motion. Ash G asked, I thought we have monopole magnets now. Polymagnets can print magnetic poles onto materials, so why can't they make just one pole? Monopole magnets are theoretical. They've never been found in the real world. There are experiments looking for them at the Large Hadron Collider, without success so far, but even if they were found, they wouldn't be the kind of thing that you could just buy at a shop. They're more like the Higgs boson, an interesting fundamental particle that helps complete our picture of the universe. 
I think there's a misconception about monopole magnets that if you take a magnet and you break it in half, you'll have one kind of only north pole and one only south pole. But actually, you'll just have two small magnets with dipoles on them, a north pole and a south pole. The Stig DMC asked, what about using gravity as a power source? So we do that all the time. Uh, that's what hydropower is. Pendulum clocks also use gravity as a power source. The problem with trying to use gravity as a perpetual motion machine is that you need to put energy into raising whatever it is you're about to drop. Andy Castaneda wondered, what would happen if you pump water through a tube to fall back into its own reservoir but turning a water wheel on the way down, in turn powering the weak pump action driving the water? Unfortunately, that won't work either. You'll lose energy to the friction in the water wheel, and the water wheel won't be able to make enough energy to raise the water. Look up Boyle's flask, though. That's a really interesting attempt at perpetual motion. It's a sort of self-flowing flask that doesn't work unless you put a bubbly liquid in it. It's not perpetual, of course, but it is really interesting. That's all we've got time for today. Keep your questions coming, and we'll be back soon.